coming up next on this special giving and leading edition of Arizona Horizon. We'll see how the Audubon Society transformed an industrial dump into a learning center for desert wildlife. We'll hear about an organization that uses music as a process for healing, and we'll visit a sanctuary for abandoned bunny rabbits. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We start our special giving and leading edition with a look at a group that's working to help kids and adults appreciate the diversity of desert living. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Steve Aaron introduce us to the people and wildlife involved in Audubon, Arizona. We're just going to head on west over here. Along Amber trail. Houston's office has a pretty nice view. I am the weekend teacher naturalist here at Audubon, Arizona. Here's her version of ringing phones, dinging emails, and chirping texts. There are no angry customers out here, only curious ones. You see where the beaver have chewed? You can actually see their teeth marks. Wow, well, you can. All along. Just right around here. They've chewed down this tree and they've just taken off the portions of the branches that they really want and they just drag them away. Yes, but, but when they bite it, do they leave germs on? I, maybe. <laughs> That's a good question. These Boy Scouts are learning about the Rio Salado Habitat Restoration Area. This is the Salt River right here. This is what, or what used to be very, very full. That was before the dams were built. When the river dried up, people started dumping trash, tires, and junk cars in and along the riverbed. They destroyed more than 90% of the native habitat. This was the most degraded place in Phoenix 15 years ago. Audubon, Arizona Executive Director Sarah Porter witnessed the transformation. With the help of federal funding, Phoenix removed nearly 1,200 tons of tires and added more than 75,000 trees, shrubs, and plants. So the Sonoran Desert is the most biodiverse desert in the world. It's really an extraordinary place. I think we're lucky to live here. We have amazing diversity of animals and plants here. They've identified more than 200 species of birds. The 600-acre restoration area is also home to jackrabbits, coyotes, and beavers, all less than two miles from downtown. What is so neat and to you guys about coming out to places and seeing places like this? What you do you to, guys get out of it? You get to go out and you're not in the city anymore and there's no loud noises, it's just nice. Like, it's just open, it's quiet. Quiet, it's like being out in the middle of nowhere, but you're yeah. not, right? You get to see like, it. It's like it is. And like, especially at night when you can look up and see the stars, you can't really see that in the city, so. In southeastern Arizona, Audubon manages an 8,000 acre ranch devoted to grasslands research. We know that humans have had a big impact on native habitats in Arizona, and when we have a place where we uh, keep it aside. We give land managers a chance to have a baseline for one thing so they can learn what a healthy native grassland would look like and um, it allows scientists to come in and see whether there are ways we could control the impacts of invasive grass, grass species like buffalo grass. Audubon also conducts annual bird surveys and offers educational and volunteer programs. This is a coma and a coma is a red-tailed hawk. We think that when people get a chance to be personally involved in protecting the environment, then they're going to be really informed when environmental questions come in the future. And besides, it makes people feel really good. In the city, I know it's beautiful, but, but sometimes we need to go get some nature. Fresh fruits and vegetables are part of a balanced diet, but for many in one Phoenix neighborhood, those simple items are too expensive or unavailable. That is, until now. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Juan Magana introduce us to the Fresh Express. Every Thursday afternoon, a different kind of bus pulls into the parking lot at Crockett Elementary. The Fresh Express is a city bus that's been converted into a mobile produce stand. It's a welcome sight for the 600 students who live in the area and whose parents struggle on a daily basis to provide enough food. According to Balls District Superintendent Jeff Smith, 90% of the students qualify for free lunch. We live in a food desert, which means that there aren't uh, easy ways for people to get fresh produce in, the, in their area. They end up going to convenience stores 
or to, to fast food restaurants for their food, and that's just not healthy. The bus is the brainchild of the Discovery Triangle Development Corporation. Its goal is to revitalize a 25 square mile area that stretches from downtown Phoenix to downtown Tempe. The bus kicked off operations in March and Corporation President Don Kuth says the response is overwhelming. The reaction has been fantastic. Uh, the parents uh, that have come, uh, the, the staff and, and, and the faculty of the, of the schools, the seniors that we've served, this is a godsend to them. It brings them stuff that they just don't get general access to. Inside the refrigerated bus are dozens of bins filled with donated vegetables and fruit from Peddler Sons, a produce distributor. You can find everything from peppers to melons. Well, we would say that we provide not only very fresh and healthy food, but we do it at a very affordable price. So we have been able to price this uh, in a way that uh, it's all uh, kind of piecemeal. We don't have to weigh things. So we can give, we'll sell three avocados for a dollar three tomatoes for a dollar. For many families, it's not just economics that makes food shopping challenging. Many don't have transportation, so having the food come to them is crucial. Well, I would say it's the best thing in life, you know. It's where you could go, pick out your favorite foods, and smell what you like, and have the most part of fun picking out the fruits and vegetables you like. And Keith says the bus is the key ingredient in the recipe to long-term success for these kids. You know, one of the benefits of this is if we can help some kids eat healthier foods, have a healthier lifestyle, that may translate into being a better student. And by being a better student, their outcome in life can change. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. St. Vincent de Paul has a new campaign to help feed the hungry during the summer. The campaign is called Be a Summer Action Hero, and it encourages donations of food and money. Shannon Clancy, Development Director for St. Vincent de Paul, and Beverly Damore, President and CEO of St. Mary's Food Bank, discuss efforts to keep people fed during the summer. It's good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Be a Summer Action Hero. Explain, please. Absolutely. Well, we, we set up the Be a Summer Action Hero campaign really to get the word out, to raise awareness. So we're grateful to you having us here today to talk about it, about the summer need in Arizona. Um, I think often with hunger issues, uh, people think about them. We all think about them during the holiday season. But right here in Arizona, when it gets hot and our electricity bills go up and kids don't have access to food programs through schools, families' budgets get really tight, and there are more and more struggling families that come to us for help. And when those electricity bills go up, families have to make a choice, don't they? Absolutely, all the time. We see it with our clients as well. So um, daycare costs are up because kids are out of school. Mm -hmm. um, food prices continue to go up, so everything is a stretch. I, I, I notice that donations seem to drop in the summer as well. Is, first of all, is that true? And secondly, why? Well, most of our donors are out of town, um, so they're lucky enough to be able to escape the heat, so they go down. Um, like Shannon said, we're just generally not top of mind during the summertime mm -hmm. like we are during the holidays. Um, but the flip side to that is our demand is the highest during the summer. So we actually distribute more pounds of food than we do during the holidays. And I would imagine as well, businesses, it's summertime, they're cutting hours, maybe cutting staff as well, and those folks, they could be needing some, I mean, they're employed, but they're underemployed and they might need some help. Absolutely. You know, I think sometimes, too, families that could do just fine during other times of the year just have a rough time at this time. They're making very, very hard choices. Do I pay the rent? Do I put food on the table? Do I pay that utility bill to keep the AC on? Or do I buy diapers for my child or take them to the doctor? Have you seen the summer months become more critical in recent years? I know the recession has kind of changed the dynamic for a lot of folks. What have you been seeing? You know what? We do. I would agree with Beverly. We, we see the need 
really extreme during the summer. And like she said, we, we really aren't aware of it as a community. You know, we've done a really nice job in this community to pay attention to heat relief efforts. Um, over the last few years when we had people dying on our streets, we've come together as a community to mobilize and have water drives and the cities have come together to make sure that people can stay safe. And we need that same kind of effort for summer food relief for families. And part of that is the awareness. When we talk about it, people say, I hadn't thought about how kids wouldn't have access to food or child care costs would go up. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm thinking about it, yes, tell me how I can help. And, and how can people help? What, what are you looking for as far as donations are concerned? Anything specific or unusual perhaps? One of the things that we're going to be looking at is we're getting real close to there not being a whole lot of fresh produce during the, during the, um, the late part of summer. So we're trying to do a really good job of stockpiling cans of fruits and vegetables right now so that we can, it's not it's maybe not an ideal replacement, but at least it's something. So the probably the toughest months for us are actually September, um, August and September. Um, but time too. Um, Shannon and I were commiserating a little mm -hmm. bit um, before we came out that our volunteers drop a lot because everybody's out of town. So we are so reliant on volunteers to come in and help build the emergency food boxes and things that go out into the community. And folks can actually they can host their own food drives, can't they? Oh, we love that. How does that work? Um, you well for us, you can go to our website, um, which is firstfoodbank.com org and we have kind of a how-to on there but food drives are great because it tends to be um, the good kind of staple pantry food that we all have and that is key to us to be able to make a, a core box to give out. I was going to say I mean you don't really think about it, donate food, donate to Canada this or can but you need healthy food, you need proteins in there don't you? Absolutely, N very much need proteins, need fruits and vegetables, needs the, need the things that are going to keep kids healthy and sometimes we don't get those so those items are really important so we do. We need people to host food drives, maybe not thinking about that as much during the summer, but we need that. We need volunteers. We need donations. I mean, at St. Vincent de Paul, we, our mission is to feed, clothe, house, and heal people. So people who are struggling with food are struggling with rent payments and maybe need help with utility payments. And so those donations help our volunteers who go into homes to help families and determine how they, how they can uh, meet their needs, they can help them directly. And is it stvincentdepaul.org? We've actually set up a special website, summerrelief.org. Summerrelief.org, yes, okay. Yes, and people can go there and they can make a donation, they can sign up to host a food drive, or they can link right to our volunteer page and find out how they can help. And again, yours was? It's firstfoodbank.org. Okay, um, regarding the Be a Summer Action Hero campaign, uh, how does this differ from other camp? I mean, I just, I'm curious in the marketing aspect. What do, what do you think and how does this kind of thing get developed? You know what? Here's what we were thinking. One, we always have big releases of superhero movies in the summer, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the issue is that everyone thinks to solve a problem like hunger in our community that you have to be the superhero that you have to go out and save the world and do all this. And the message that we want to send to people is that we can all be that superhero. And part of it is just to harness that power of compassion that we have. And instead of trying to help the whole world, we just help the person in front of us. That's the model I think that we, we use at St. Vincent de Paul and we're inviting everyone to be part of it. it all they have to do is make a donation of, of food, of some money of setting up the food drive, of coming in and giving a few hours, and all of those efforts coming together, that's what makes a difference in the community. We've done it in heat relief, and we can do it in food relief for families. And again, as a president and CEO of, of, of a major food bank here, the concept of marketing, the concept of getting your message out, how, I mean, what are the challenges there? Well, it's important, um, but I think I, I wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Shannon was saying. I think it's important for people to understand you don't have to hero is is a great term how because we're efficient organizations at St. Mary's you can donate a dollar and it's enough to provide seven meals so um, people don't have to go out and spend months planning a food drive I mean a little effort goes a long long way um, in terms of marketing um, I think at St. Mary's we're lucky we're getting close to celebrating our 50th anniversary we've got um, good name recognition um, we're a good organization that does exactly what it should, but we are constantly working to stay yeah. top of mind. I would imagine. Well, congratulations on Be a Summer Action Thank Hero, you. and hopefully you'll get some Summer Action Heroes to donate. Good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you so you. much for Thank joining us. Thank you so much. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an Aid Insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the Aid Insider delivered to your email inbox. 
Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Up next, we look at the power of music, which can make us smile or relax or give us energy. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Stephen Snow show us how a group in Tempe is making music that does all of the above and more. There's just something about harp music that's ethereal, and I think people instantly relate to it. Even the tiny patients inside St. Joseph's neonatal intensive care unit. The sound is, is air being pushed through her nose. It's just a reminder that she needs to breathe. It may look like Jocelyn Obermeyer is just playing music for baby Mary. She likes this one right here. But she's also tuning in medically. And I tailor the music to what I hear coming out of them. And the first thing I listen for is can I hear their pitch? It's very subtle and that's part of the training is how to hear the sounds that are coming out of people. Jocelyn first learned of the harp's power six years ago. That's when she was a school principal faced with a parent volunteer who was losing her fight against cancer. She just went on and on and on about how relaxing it was. Um, how it calmed her down, how she was able to breathe better, and how it healed her inner soul, knowing she was going to pass. But hearing this beautiful music as she was on that transition, and it kept knocking at my heart to do. I'm a musician, so I play other instruments, but it just kept knocking, play the harp, play the harp. And so I would get harp music and listen to it and felt so called to that work that I learned to play the harp, stopped being a principal, and literally jumped right into it. Today, Jocelyn is among 10 musicians with the Harp Foundation. They play in lobbies and rooms across five Valley hospitals. What we found through evidence-based research is that if we bring therapeutic harp music into a situation where there's a lot of pain, it just immediately relaxes the situation. And um, patients can heal faster. They, their medications work faster and better, and they're able to leave the hospital earlier. Patients aren't the only ones touched by the strings. The demands of watching patients, the demands of all the technology, you see alarms and beeps and everything going on. So what we found is using the heart music actually for even for just a few minutes to staff members actually calm them down and relax them as if they had taken a 30 minute break. I've been a nurse here for 10 years. And Patty Peterson has witnessed the transformation on staff, patients, and her own family. As her daughter struggled during childbirth, something caught Patty's ear. I go to the door and right outside her room, there's a woman sitting there playing the harp. And I got very emotional because my mother played the harp. And so I thanked her and I said, I really appreciate this. It means a lot for us to do this. So I went back inside and I said to my daughter, Eden, Grandma's here and she can't stay very long. So I want you, I get emotional when I talk about it. I want you to get that baby out right, right now. So within a few minutes, she delivered a beautiful, healthy baby girl, my first grandchild. The more that she rests and is comfortable, the more energy she'll store up. So it gives her that amount to be able to, to eat and to interact. Julianne Kernigus knows the melodies help her newborn. She had her eyes open and then closed and then she was moving her mouth. So I, I can tell that she was that she had heard her playing. And then when she stopped, she opened her eyes and noticed that she had stopped. So I think that she really enjoyed that. So does mom. It helps calm you and to, you know, put things into perspective and to realize that, you know, this is what we're here for. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. We end our Giving and Leading special with a look at a place for displaced pets. Maricopa County ranks second only to Los Angeles County when it comes to pet overpopulation. Most people think of dogs and cats when considering the issue of unwanted pets, but as producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana show us, there's another animal that often needs help. 
When we created this, we wanted to create something uh, that was a cheery place, a happy place. That place is Tranquility Trail, a sanctuary for domestic bunnies. That's Gigi, and she's our youngest bunny. She's four months old. Kelly Ames and her volunteers care for 75 bunnies at the Scottsdale Shelter. Sadly, we do have a one-year waiting list of people who are wanting to surrender their rabbits. Rabbits are actually the third most surrendered animal in the shelter system, and there are very few resources for them. Sometimes they get rabbits directly from people who no longer want them. And sometimes bunnies are just dumped outdoors, like baby Gigi. She was abandoned in a shoebox um, with no food and no water with sick baby bunny written across it. Gigi is doing well now, and so is Fred, but it's taken a while. He had to have an eye removed, he had abscesses, he's had respiratory issues, but he's always been the happiest little guy. They rescued Fred and many others from a woman who didn't even know how many rabbits lived in her backyard. She thought she had about 40 when she called us. So when we got there, you know, we were a bit surprised that there were uh, actually 107, but three of the girls were pregnant and had 25 babies between them two days after we got everybody here. That was more than three years ago, and they still have nearly 50 rabbits from that rescue. A lot of these bunnies have come to us from places where people haven't been very kind to them. So it's our job to teach them to trust people again. And as a prey animal, uh, it does take a little longer for bunnies to trust new people. Kelly never rushes adoptions. She stays focused on finding the right family for each rabbit. Some are super active, some are more couch potatoes, some are really needy, some are more independent. Like this one, named Bianca. AKA Diva. She's queen bee. She just wants to do her own thing. Christine Martin visits Tranquility Trail twice a week. Aren't you silly? Why are you silly? She volunteers to feed the rabbits and clean their rooms. I'll give them new uh, linens or blankets. I I'm actually one of the bunny's new interior designer because I like to decorate his home very special depending on the day and, you know, how he's feeling that day. This self-described cat lover says bunnies have a calming effect on her. I am definitely a bunny person now, for sure. The bunnies are all litter box trained and can run around the house just like cats and dogs. Their daily exercise includes an hour a day in one of eight play areas. Every time I come here and I walk through that door, it is the most amazing experience for me. The compassion, the love, and the peacefulness that I feel when I'm here, just, it makes me so happy. Kelly wants others to feel that way too. That's why Tranquility Trail is open to the public seven days a week. We have so many people come in just to visit. They've just been driving by and they're curious as to what we do. And by the end of their visit, they almost always say, wow, I didn't know bunnies were so smart or they didn't know they were so fun or they didn't know they had such personality. And I think once people start to see that, things will change for them. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us on this special giving and leading edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great evening. If you have comments about Arizona Horizon, please contact us at one of the addresses on your screen. Your comments may be used on a future edition of Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.